Good afternoon, everyone. The first item of business this afternoon is Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Questions. Um, question one, Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the SPCB if it would consider improving the lighting in the garden lobby exhibition area um, to improve the visibility uh, for greater photograph opportunities. Thanks. Uh, Linda Fabiani. Yes, um, can I say to Mr Robertson um, that I do understand um, the difficulty um, that he's talking about in relation to better photo opportunities. However, consideration was given back in 2012 to installing additional lighting in that space. But there are technical challenges and this has resulted in a significant cost, so we didn't pursue that option. As an alternative, we use specialised lighting attached to the display boards and that illuminates the various different exhibitions in the area. Uh, this lighting is not designed to add light to the general area and the corporate body has no plans to install additional lighting there. Thanks, Dennis Robertson. I, I thank Linda Fabiani for that response. And, and I can fully understand uh, if there's a, a significant cost uh, and technical problems. But what I do wonder is whether or not um, does the Parliament provide the additional lighting for the exhibition boards and could any additional lighting be uh, uh, added? Because when people come and obviously they're, they're displaying the events, the exhibitions, one of the things they want to do is to ensure that they as an organisation can get good quality photographs out to their social media. Thanks. Linda Fabian. Uh, yes, I can see that issue. And yes, we do um, install that additional lighting for lighting the boards, etc. Sorry, not install, supply uh, for the boards, etc. I mean, there are technical challenges associated with doing any permanent lighting. And as I said, the cost is prohibitive. Uh, but I'm sure um, that the staff of the Parliament, the relevant staff, are always willing to look at how things can be enhanced. And um, I would hope that following this subject being raised in the chamber, that we can look again, not at installation of permanent lighting, but about other options that could perhaps be used to give a better experience for those who, who use that space. Many thanks. Question two, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body how it disposes of food that is left over from events and functions. De Fabiani. Well, to start off with, um, the events and catering teams work very closely with the event organisers to try and provide guidance on the food choices and, most importantly, the amount of food required. So any food that is left over is put into the food waste bins and that is collected by our waste disposal contractor and taken away for composting. Um, obviously, that helps reduce the amount of waste that we send to incineration. Thank you very much. John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank Linda Fabiani for that response. According to Greener Scotland, every year 380,000 tonnes of food and drink are thrown away, which didn't have to be. This costs the Scottish public over a billion pounds every year. The Parliament has the objective to be a zero waste Parliament. Throwing out food doesn't seem to be in line with this ideal. Could it be possible for the corporate body to discuss with caterers and others? to look at the possibility of where possible that food that's left over from functions and events is passed on to the various food kitchens in Edinburgh which supply food to essential homelessness individuals and others who demand to be fed. And the Fabiani. Uh, can I say first of all to the member that these, these discussions go on all the time because the parliament very, very seriously um, takes its responsibilities to try and reduce waste of all kinds and food waste um, all the time. And that is why we have these detailed discussions with those organising the events. And that's why we're also looking at installing a food waste monitoring tool so that we can understand a bit better uh, how and where food is being wasted so that we can have better discussion, more informed discussion and take appropriate measures. Can I say though that there are issues around what on the surface of it seems a very worthy um, way of doing things, you know, as suggested by the member. Um, but one has to remember that when one's catering for events, the food is unpackaged, it's been prepared, served, it's not temperature controlled, 
And you have to be very careful that you don't allow something to become a risk for human consumption. And sometimes it actually has to be classed as waste. Having said that, discussions are always ongoing about how best to manage these things. And I am absolutely sure that the good management of the SPCB staff in this institution will carry on that discussion along with the corporate body that is elected after the election in May. Many thanks. Mary Scanlon. Presiding officer, many of us would actually like to increase the amount of food for disposal, uh, and I refer in particular to the coffee in committee rooms. Uh, on behalf of my colleague on the Audit and Education Committee, Colin Beattie, and colleagues across this Parliament from all parties, can I ask if the corporate body will ensure that new and, new and existing and continuing MSPs get a decent cup of coffee in committee in session five? Fabiani. Um, <laughs> I guess it's all a matter of taste. I quite like the, the coffee uh, that we get in committees. I know that there's, uh, in fact, I think we're very lucky getting coffee in committees. I mean, it's hard times now, it's an aesthetic. <laughs> so, can I say uh, to Mary Scanlon that I have heard this over the last couple of years, and I know that the Parliament uh, staff have had coffee tastings for members um, to try and choose what they thought was the best coffee. I don't know what else we can do, to be perfectly honest, to Mrs Scanlon. Um, I would suggest that the fact that very often the coffee urns are empty would suggest that most people are quite happy with the coffee as offered. Um, I'm trying to think on my feet of a solution here. You can get very good coffee bags and we could probably supply some really hot water. Uh, Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. I share Mary Scanlon's concerns with the coffee, and uh, and I've, you know, I'd, I'd compliment her actually on her efforts to improve the quality of the coffee. One thing that I have observed that may help the corporate body is that, on odd occasions, I've been in committees that I've met very early in the day, and on those occasions, the coffee seems to taste much better. So I would suggest that part of the problem, at least, may be the fact that at times coffee is left standing in those vacuum flasks for quite a long time, and that impinges on the quality of its flavour. And so if the corporate body are going to direct their activities in such a way as to improve the quality of the coffee, perhaps they could look at minimising the amount of time the coffee is in those uh, vacuum flasks. Brenda Fabiani. It's me again. Perhaps the next corporate—I'm going to pass the buck here. Perhaps the next corporate body could look at this, but could I suggest that people get a bit more healthier and drink more water? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, Dennis Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Linda Fabiani is not expecting this one either, presiding um, <clears throat> officer. Uh, but on the same topic of food waste, I'm just wondering if the SPCB have considered—and uh, they probably have—but in the mornings when breakfast is over, the what's left is gone into waste immediately. Would they not consider using um, the bacon, the sausages, etc., into rolls? I love cold bacon rolls. And maybe sell them on later? Fabiani. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I think there are folk in this establishment that are paid to be looking at such options. And I'm sure that they're listening avidly to this session to see if that there's anything they can do to improve the experience of MSPs. And we'll get back to you on that one, Mr Robertson. <laughs> Thank you very much. And that concludes this item of business. And we now move to the next item of business, which is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Health, Tobacco, Nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill. And in dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at Stage 2, the marshal list and the groupings. Division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds and thereafter I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. 
Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to seat buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. And members should now refer to the Marshall list of amendments, uh, which we will now turn to and will ad address Group 1. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own. Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 1, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a technical amendment required as a result of an, of an amendment to the Bill at Stage 2. <clears throat> the Stage 2 amendment added to the relevant enforcement actions, which can count towards an application for a tobacco and NVP banning order. The purpose of the amendment is to make clear that this is not a requirement that at least one offence has to have been committed under Chapters 1 and 2 of the 2010 Act before a sheriff could be satisfied that a banning order can be issued. This ensures that a banning order can be applied for where the three relevant enforcement actions pertain to convictions under Section 92.1b or C of the Trade Marks Act 1994. I move Amendment 1. Yes. Many thanks. <laughs> and so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. I will now move to Group 2 and call Amendment 3 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm, Group with Amendment 4. Mr Chisholm, to move Amendment 3 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, these two amendments relate to the section of the Bill that deals with the duty uh, of candour. And as, uh, as most members will, will know, this arises if a person experiences unintended harm. And in that situation, the organisation involved will have a duty to tell the person, to support them, to review the situation, to learn lessons and to uh, apologise. And uh, I'm a strong supporter of the duty of candour. But when I, with some of my colleagues on the Health and Sport Committee, uh, visited Argowan hospice back in September as part of our palliative care inquiry. We also asked them about uh, this bill and in particular the duty of candour section of it and the consultant in palliative care and I think some other staff at the hospice did raise a concern then that there may be uh, some people who do not wish uh, to be informed uh, about uh, the, um, the, uh, the experience uh, which has caused uh, unintended uh, Harm. I mean, they were obviously thinking of a hospice situation, but there may be other situations uh, when the person doesn't want to know, or it could even be the relative, of course, if the person in question is no longer uh, alive. So this was um, a question that was also raised in our Stage 1 uh, deliberations, and um, Peter Walsh of Action Against uh, Medical Accidents was one of the people giving evidence, and he's had a great deal ex of experience of how the duty of candour has operated in England. Uh, it's already in law there. And he's a great supporter of the duty of candour. But I did find what he said about one of the provisions in English legislation quite interesting. And I'll just read uh, his quotation briefly. He says, the way that it has been dealt with in England is that there is a requirement to tell the patient or service user or their family that there is something to report and to discuss. And they can simply say, thanks, but I don't want to know. And he goes on, let us say that mum or dad has passed away. The family can say, we're moving on and we don't want to know another thing. And he says, that is their absolute right, but it is not the right of any individual health professional or organisation to decide for them that they do not need the opportunity to know. And that last bit is very important because we're trying to get beyond the paternalistic culture that we used to have in the health service. So we may think or whoever the appropriate uh, um, health professional may think, oh, well, it's not really in the interests of this person uh, to know this, or the interests of the relative of this deceased person to know this. But that is not the way to deal with this, because people have the right to know, and they must therefore be asked if they wish to know. So my amendments are an attempt to deal with this. I introduced amendments at the committee stage, and I've now done it in what I think is a simpler form uh, and also take, a, take account of one of the concerns raised by the Minister in, in response to my amendments at committee. Now, I'll, a great deal of um, what is uh, going to um, govern the uh, duty of candour uh, procedures is in regulations, and this, the, the critical section of the Bill is uh, Clause 22, and I have uh, added bits, uh, or proposed adding bits, to two of those sections. Section 3 
uh, 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 it, it says section 22, subsection 2, uh, and again, subsection C of that refers to the, the meeting with the relevant person. And what I proposed at the end that, uh, that, the, 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 that in the regulations governing that, they should include asking the relevant question whether uh, re the relevant person, whether the relevant person wishes to receive uh, an account of the incident. But one of the points that the Minister made in committee was, of course, even when, they, when the person or the relative of the person expresses a wish not to know, it's still critically important that there is a review of the circumstances that have led to the harm. And therefore, I've proposed another amendment in this case to subsection I, uh, which relates to reviewing uh, the circumstances and I've uh, proposed there that even if the relevant person is advised that the relevant person does not wish to receive an account of the incident, uh, the review still has to go ahead so that lessons can be learned. So uh, I accept that um, a lot of this is going to be in regulations but there is a general question always when we pass legislation, to what extent are we just going to take on trust what's going to be in the regulations or to what extent should we flag up in primary legislation what must be in the regulations? And I think my amendments strike the right balance here. I accept we can't work out all the details of this uh, in this bill today, but I think we should have the right to flag up uh, certain really important um, dimensions uh, of uh, the regulations. So I'll listen, obviously, with interest to what uh, the Minister uh, says uh, about this, but in the meantime, I move Amendment 3. Many thanks. Now call on Dr. Nanette Milne. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise very briefly uh, to support Malcolm Chisholm's amendments. Um, my experience in, in the health service, I'm well aware that there are patients who certainly don't want to know the detail of what goes on, even in their, their own treatment, whether, whether there have been mistakes or not. But I, I, I appreciate that for the duty of candour, it is necessary for them to know there has been something. But I think it should be absolutely within their right uh, not to have to hear the detail of, of what the, the concern is. And uh, I think Malcolm Chisholm's uh, amendments actually well, support what I think on this issue. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Rhoda Grant. Um, very briefly again, presiding officer, at stage two, I argued that the duty of candour should um, go through all health and social care processes and that patients should be informed of their treatment and given most, uh, all the information that was available. And that was to make that treatment person-centred and I think Malcolm's amendments just emphasise that, that the person must be in control of the information they receive and whether or not they want detail. Um, so it is about the person being at the very centre of that treatment so they can refuse to have information or they can indeed have all the information about their care. Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Like uh, the other speakers, I recognise that it may not always be in the best interests of the individual to be told about what has happened. And in implementing the duty of candour, organisations will be required to consider this carefully and ensure that they don't have a one-size-fits-all approach to disclosing information. Organisations will be required to check whether or not the affected person wants to be told about what went wrong. But regardless, the main aim is that organisations will be required to take steps to review incidents, whether or not the affected person wants to be told about what went wrong. The bill allowed this to be included in regulations, and the Scottish Government's Duty of Candour Implementation Advisory Group will, of course, include this in taking forward the bill's implementation. Presiding officer, given Malcolm Chisholm's persistence on this point in the bill, and perhaps as a parting gift from the Scottish Government, I'm content to support Amendments 3 and 4. Malcolm Tism to wind up and press to withdraw his amendment. Well, I thank the Minister very much for that, but I can assure you I'm not parting yet. I've got two and a half weeks' worth of speeches left. Thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. Call Amendment 4 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm, already debated with Amendment 3. Mr Chisholm, to move or not? I uh, move. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Many thanks. We now move to Group 3. And I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister and a group on its own. Minister Maureen Watt to move and speak to Amendment 2, please. Presiding Officer, I indicated at Stage 2 that an amendment would be brought forward at Stage 3 in relation to the care worker offence of ill treatment or willful neglect. 
that is set out in section 26 of the bill. This amendment adds that offence to the list of offences in the Police Scotland 1997 Act, which must always be disclosed on higher level disclosures. And I thank Mary Scanlon for the uh, work that she did on this uh, particular amendment. The serious nature of this offence and the breach of trust involved is such that the passage of time will not diminish the relevance of this information to a prospective employer or organisation. This amendment ensures that Disclosure Scotland will always disclose, disclose spent convictions for this offence. The inclusion of this offence on the offences which must always be disclosed list means that no matter how old the conviction is, it will always be disclosed on a higher level disclosure and therefore available to employers and voluntary organisations. I move Amendment 2. Many thanks. Um, now I call on Mary Scanlon. Um, can I thank the Minister uh, for her response and can I also thank her for uh, the very reasonable hearing that I felt that uh, I got at stage two and uh, I'm grateful that she has brought forward the amendment today. And can I just say that this was born out of, like most of us, a constituent, Mrs Blan Bremner, whose mother, Mrs Doreen McIntyre, died in a care home in Inverness. She gave me permission to use her name and she's asked me what I could do in this parliament to stop people who abuse and neglect and maltreat uh, elderly people in care homes from simply walking out and getting another job. So I'm very, very grateful to Maureen Watt, uh, the Minister, for bringing forward this amendment. Given that I'm not on the committee and I'm not steeped in the understanding of the bill, I wonder if I may just ask for some clarity. Uh, at stage two, uh, the Minister did say, and if I may read, in, uh, in addition, more specifically, in relation to the offences in Part 3 of the Bill, a court may, when convicting an individual, refer that individual to Disclosure, Disclosure Scotland if it thinks that might be appropriate for the individual to be considered for listing. Uh, that was the Minister's response at Stage 2, and I heard what she said today but this just slightly bothers me because it seems to bring a degree of uncertainty, saying that the court may, when convicting the individual, may refer to Disclosure Scotland only if they think it's appropriate to be considered for listing. So I know on behalf of Mrs Bland Bremner, she certainly wouldn't like anyone to suffer in the way that her mother did, and it's just to make sure that this is quite watertight. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Minister, to wind up. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just in relation to uh, Mary Scanlon's point, I will make sure um, that what she uh, says is, is clarified in the regulations and guidelines on the uh, implementation of the Bill. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And that ends consideration of amendments. And we now move rapidly to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15801 in the name of Maureen Watt on the health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. and care Scotland Bill. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Minister Maureen Watt to speak to and move the motion. Minister, you have a generous 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm delighted to open the debate today on the health tobacco, nic nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill. I'd like to thank the Finance Committee, the de Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and particularly the Health and Sport Committee for their consideration and scrutiny of the Bill as it has progressed through the parliamentary process. The Bill is a wide-ranging Bill and, if passed, will contribute towards helping people live longer, healthier lives, tackling significant inequalities in Scottish society and to improving the delivery of health and social care services in Scotland. Cross-party support in this Parliament to prevent the harm caused by tobacco use has seen Scotland remain a world leader on tobacco control. This Government has been clear that it will continue to encourage everyone, but particularly children and young people, to choose not to smoke. By so doing, we hope to create a tobacco-free generation of Scots by 2034 creating an offence of smoking and of knowingly permitting smoking in a perimeter around buildings on NHS hospital grounds 
is an important step in continuing to denormalise smoking behaviour and achieving our ambitious target. As I've said before, it's not about stigmatising smokers. Preventing ill health is a major challenge for our health services now and in the future. Tobacco remains the biggest cause of preventable disease and death in Scotland, and I'm proud that the NHS have and will continue to show leadership in supporting and promoting healthy behaviours, particularly around tackling smoking. The bill brings forward controls specific to e-cigarettes for the first time in Scotland, or nicotine vapour products, NVPs, as they are termed in the bill. There has been much debate about, around the potential risk and the potential benefits of these products amongst experts. Such interesting and lively debate has also been evident during this Parliament's consideration of the Bill, but I am pleased that we have not allowed that debate to become sensational. The Scottish Government has worked closely with experts and stakeholders and listened to their views in order to achieve the right balance in regulating NVPs. I'm pleased that we can all agree that non-medicinal NVPs should not be available to children under the age of 18 and that over 18s should be prevented from purchasing them on their behalf. Such agreement has also been widespread for the benefits associated with placing further age controls on the sale and purchase of tobacco products. The requirement for persons intending to sell NVPs to register on the register of tobacco and NVP retailers has been the focus of much of the debate on part one of the bill. That is because of concerns raised that the requirement to have a single register will send a message that NVPs are just as harmful as tobacco products. However, there has been agreement that a single register is required in order to reduce the burden on retailers and enforcement officers. As I indicated in my response to the Health and Sport Committee, this is issue is about how the register is presented. I've already committed to providing a separation between the products on the website where the register is held. This does not require a change to the legislation and will be managed during implementation. There's nothing in this bill which demonises NVPs or NVP users, and I've been clear that any public health gains should not be hindered by unnecessary regulation. However, there has been agreement that there is no place for marketing of the products to children, young people and non-smokers. The detail of such prohibition will be set out in regulations. The bill also places a duty of candour on health and social care organisations. Increasingly, it is recognised that openness and transparency are essential elements of health and social care systems. The duty of candour will apply to those organisations which provide health care, social care and social work services and it will help to promote an open learning culture and accountability for safer systems. It will be a driver for staff engagement in improvement work and it will engender greater trust amongst patients and service users. The bill requires that when an organisation becomes aware that there has been an adverse event resulting in harm, the duty of candour procedure must be followed. The procedure, which will be set out in regulations, will require organisations to take action to meet with and apologise to the affected person and provide support to them. The procedure will detail the requirements for the recording and monitoring of incidents and the provision of training and support for those carrying out the duty of candour procedure. The bill requires all organisations to report publicly on the number and nature of the events that have been disclosed to people and confirm that the obligations of the organisational duty of candour have been met. It is worth remembering that legislation forms only one part of the duty of candour. We will work with stakeholders to produce guiding, guidance and national training resources to assist organisations in the implementation of the duty of candour. <clears throat> Many organisations already have procedures in place for handling complaints or responding to adverse or significant events, and therefore the additional administrative demands of the duty of candour should be minimal for most. Presiding officer, care, compassion and dignity are central to the vast majority of health and social care which is delivered every day 
right across Scotland. The provisions in the Bill on ill treatment or willful neglect strengthen corporate accountability in health and social care and allow the criminal justice system to hold individuals and organisations to account where they are responsible for serious and deliberate neglect or ill treatment in the course of providing care. These offences are not about catching people who are doing the best they can in a busy environment. They are about dealing with those situations where someone intentionally sets out to neglect or ill-treat another in their care. Where neglect or abuse has taken place, it is important that there is access to justice for those victims of such neglect or abuse. This bill will help to achieve that. Provision of communication equipment and the associated support required to use that equipment are key requirements of children and adults who have lost their voice or have difficulty speaking. The provisions in the bill place an explicit duty on Scottish ministers to provide or secure the provision of communication equipment and associated support. In addition, under the existing powers of the 1978 Act, Scottish ministers will issue directions to health boards in the near future to help support the discharge of this duty. These directions will de be developed in consultation with a group of st stakeholders and will contain the correct level of detail to address the operational issues which we know are a cause for concern. The group will meet next week to start the development process. Presiding officer, loss of voice has a huge impact on individuals affected and this bill will ensure that those in need have access to the appropriate equipment. Importantly, they will also have access to the support they require to enable them to lead as independent a life, a life as possible and participate in society. Presiding officer, I move motion number S4M15801 in my name that the parliament agrees that the Health, Tobacco, Nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill be passed. Many thanks. I now call on Rhoda Grant, a generous seven minutes. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I firstly thank committee staff, um, the legislation team and all the others who helped with the process of the bill and also all those who came to committee and give evidence in person and those who submitted evidence in writing, helping us to scrutinise this legislation. Presiding officer, the bill is a bit cobbled together. Um, it's a piece of legislation that covers many different areas and sometimes appears to confuse issues and appears to link them together as being part of the same thing. But actually, sometimes that's been unhelpful. Um, controlling nicotine vapour products and legislation to stop smoking outside hospitals makes a link between the two issues. And that, I think, sometimes became uh, an issue that caused confusion as was introducing a duty of candour in the same place as criminalising willful neglect. Again, at times, confused, um, bringing link, drawing links that simply were not there. Um, if I can turn to NVP's nicotine vapour products firstly, I think it's fair to say that we're a long way from having the last word on NVP's. Evidence is sketchy with a new product and therefore legislation will change as more becomes known about them. What's clear, however, is that evidence strongly suggests that they're much safer than cigarettes and could save lives as an alternative to smoking. And therefore, any negative suggestions within the bill that discourage people from moving from cigarettes to MVPs wouldn't be helpful. Um, but that said, we can't say that MVPs are safe either. Um, there's little legislation covering the chemicals that are included in the various brands. Um, they don't all have the same chemicals in them and therefore it's difficult to assess any harm and indeed legislate for it. Neither is it clear what the health effects of some of those chemicals are, some of nicotine, but that's not always the case. So while we would encourage smokers to move to NVPs, it would be foolhardy to suggest that non-smokers um, should take up vaping as well. Um, the legislation, as it um, looks at smoking in hospital grounds, tended to get confused with NVPs, but it didn't include NVPs um, at all. 
Much of the, this, the part of the bill dealing with smoking in hospital grounds will be delivered through regulations, and that will require to be scrutinised. It is difficult sometimes to imagine how the legislation will work in practice, given, given the different locations that will, that will be covered uh, by the regulations. I think was, what was clear in the committee was that windows and doorways um, should be always clear of smoking about how you then maybe deliver that if, if they're looking out on a street as something different. There was concerns about staff having to enforce this legislation or if they didn't find in themselves at odds with the law. And there were also concerns that staff might also commit an offence if they were assisting patients um, to get outside if they wanted to smoke. And the minister assured us that this was not the case, that the only staff that would be involved in enforcing the legislation would be those that were employed specifically for that purpose. So therefore, there's no conflict between policing the legislation and the needs of a patient and indeed the duty of patient care. The bill, as, as we spoke about in amendments, introduces a duty of candour for health, social care and social work organisations. And that means that if a patient or a client is accidentally harmed by treatment, they need to be told. However, the bill only legislates for this in cases where the harm is significant and there's a reporting procedure as well as a procedure for an apology to be given. I still maintain that there should be a duty of candour running through all actions and errors so that we have open and transparent services and people should be informed of all aspects of their treatment as well as when mistakes are made. And this would build confidence in the service and lead to a patient-centred approach. Um, while it would be time-consuming um, and impossible indeed to surround all of that um, ethos and duty of candour with a bureaucracy, it should be part of what is recognised as the information that patients are due to, to have and should have at all times, unless, as Malcolm Chisholm um, suggested in his amendment, they, they, they do not wish to have that information. The part of the bill um, that, leads, uh, that talks about willful neglect was sometimes confused um, with um, the duty of candour um, because they seem to be on the same spe spectrum, and that's absolutely not the case. The duty of candour is about informing patients about in an unintended consequences and genuine mistakes. Willful neglect is just that. It's willful. Um, it's neglect and mistreatment, and it is intentional, either through direct malice towards a patient or client, or because the owner or manager does not provide adequate resources to ensure that there is a reasonable quality of care in an establishment. Where a carer cannot provide an acceptable level of care because they haven't been given the time or resources, then they are not liable, but their employer is. However, if they neglect or mistreat a service user, they will be personally responsible. And most people in the caring professions are compassionate and provide selfless care, and I think we would all pay tribute to them. However, there is a minority who choose to enter the profession, but who don't really care about the treatment of vulnerable people. So it's only right that they should feel the full force of the law. And I'm really pleased um, that anyone convicted under um, this law will have that conviction remain so that they can't be put they can never be in the position um, that they can do that again. At stage two, the government put forward um, an amendment that added um, the provision of communication uh, equipment to the bill, and I think this was um, certainly welcomed by everybody in the committee and beyond. The amendment is down to the work and dedication of Gordon Aikman, who has campaigned tirelessly for this and indeed for better services across the board for people with disabilities. He's an amazing man who's achieved a lot in such a short space of time. We can only imagine what losing the ability to speak is. It will be devastating. Um, and therefore, communication equipment is a lifeline to allow people to express their wishes and to continue to be part of their social network. How frustrating it must be to be able to listen, surrounded by people, but not be able to contribute. And when that discussion um, is about your own life and the, your circumstances and care. It must be even worse. A right to communication equipment is therefore necessary and I welcome addition to this bill. 
the presiding officer, in conclusion, I'd like to say that we will be supporting the bill tonight because we believe it will make a real difference to the lives of our constituents. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Nanette Milne, a generous five minutes, Dr Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This afternoon sees the completion of the fifth piece of legislation scrutinised by the Health and Sport Committee in the last few months of this Parliament. And I'd like to echo the thanks already expressed to all those who've contributed to our understanding of the Bill's provision and worked to make improvements to it as it has made its way through the parliamentary process. I feel particularly indebted to the committee clerks who have shouldered a heavy workload recently and to the witnesses who provided written and oral evidence to us as we scrutinised the bill in its early stages. The Health, Tobacco, Nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill contains three important pieces of legislation. Part one, as we know, progresses the Scottish Government's anti-smoking strategy by including policies around tobacco, nicotine and smoking. Part two introduces a duty of candour to encourage a culture of openness within the NHS and social care services. And part three brings in a new offence of willful neglect and ill-treatment aimed at health and social care professionals and providers of care. In preparing for this short debate, I found the briefings from Ash Scotland and the Royal College of Nursing very useful as they neatly sum up the general response to the provisions of the bill as it comes to the end of its parliamentary scrutiny. Part one dealing with the regulation of electronic cigarettes and a statutory ban on smoking within a designated dis distance from hospital buildings is widely accepted and welcomed. Ash Scotland focuses on NVPs as a means of reducing the use of tobacco, which is the goal of everyone involved in public health. There's a growing body of anecdotal evidence that e-cigarettes have assisted previously very heavy smokers to quit smoking when all other attempts have failed and whilst any potential harm from the use of NVPs will have to be monitored over time, there seems little doubt that they are very much safer than tobacco products. There are, however, concerns about people who are using NVPs alongside tobacco, and particularly about attempts to recruit non-smokers into nicotine use via NVPs. This is why the Bill's proposals for age restrictions, for a ban on self-service uh, sales through vending machines, and a requirement for the registration of people selling e-cigarettes and for them to adopt age verification policies are seen as sensible and proportionate. The proposed restrictions on marketing and particularly on promotions aimed at young people will, I think, be useful in preventing vaping becoming a gateway to smoking, which appears to be happening in some countries, although not yet in the UK, I believe. The ban on smoking in designated parts of hospital grounds will give statutory backing to the current position of most NHS boards, which have introduced smoke-free policies in hospital grounds and is receiving a general welcome. Although I have had concerns expressed to me about patients in psychiatric hospitals who find it extremely difficult to give up smoking. I do, however, agree with the health board's assertions that the physical health of people with a mental health problem is as important for them as it is for other members of society. So in this context, I do find Ash Scotland's suggestion of testing the success of weaning such patients onto e-cigarettes to help them quit tobacco altogether an interesting proposal, and one which could also be, be tested in the prison population where heavy smoking is also the norm. Presiding officer, I fully accept that NVPs are much safer than tobacco-based products, but there is as yet no knowledge of any potential harmful effects of vaping in the future. And so I think that the evolving use of NVPs needs to be monitored over time. And to that effect, I would hope that a future parliament might find time to look at the effectiveness of the proposed legislation on, on public health in a few years' time. Uh, with regard to other parts of the bill, uh, some concerns have been expressed about the need to introduce a duty of candour. But I think there's a general acceptance of it as a driver for cultural change within health and social care services. However, the RCN still has serious reservations um, about part three of the bill, which introduces the offence of ill-treatment and willful neglect, because it feels that it might work against building the culture of transparency, which we all want to see within our health and social care services. If people feel they could be under the threat of litigation, particularly when they're faced with the stresses of a shortage in workforce capacity. The duty to provide or procure communication aids and support for those who need them is, of course, a very welcome addition to the bill, which I'm more than happy to endorse. 
because, as the Minister has said, communication is essential for human well-being, and the inability to communicate can be quite devastating for people so affected. I remember a friend of mine who'd had a stroke, and following which um, he, he could understand what people were saying, but he could not articulate back. And it was very, very obvious that was the most frustrating thing that he ever had to cope with in his life. And he was like that until his dying day. So I do feel very strongly about that particular matter. Presiding officer, I will go into a little more detail about the reservations expressed about parts two and three of the bill in my closing remarks. But overall, I find its provisions acceptable and Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the bill at decision time this afternoon. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to the open debate, and I call on Willie Coffey to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. The, the bill marks another stage in post, I think, in the long journey to improve public health in Scotland and our aim of limiting exposure to smoking and to discourage smoking behaviours. If the bill is approved, it will also help improve patient safety and the rights of patients by introducing this duty of candour or openness for care providers that was debated and agreed earlier. It will help us regulate the sale of NVPs eh, or e-cigarettes and it aims to reduce the possible exposure that youngsters are currently getting to these products and making ill treatment and willful neglect in social care settings a criminal offence. The overall aim is tobacco no more by 2034. A tobacco-free generation in Scotland with the consequent benefits for public health and savings for the public purse are key prizes to be won if we are successful. But it won't be easy. We're dealing with addiction and substantial vested interests. And frankly, many people actually like cigarettes and don't intend giving them up. But it's interventions like this that, that we make to stop people taking up the habit that will probably get us to that tobacco-free Scotland eventually. Um, it's estimated that it costs the NHS in Scotland about £400 million every year treating smoking-related illnesses with about 13,500 admissions and, sadly, about 13,500 deaths each year attributable directly to smoking. If you look at the scale of the problem we have, cigarette sales in the UK are worth about £13 billion a year and a nice cheque of about £10 billion of that goes to the Treasury in duty in VAT. Sales of e-cigarettes in the UK were estimated about £127 million a year. Last year, nearly 33 billion cigarettes were released into the market in the UK, and you can estimate that of that, about 3 billion or so of these were smoked by people in Scotland. But thankfully, the trend is coming down. In 1999, over 30% of adults over 16 smoked in Scotland. And now it's down to about 23% or thereabouts. And that, I think, has to give us all some encouragement. The bill itself splits into the three parts, as members, some members have, have said already. The first prohibits the sale of e-cigarettes or NVPs to anybody under 18. And it will be an offence to purchase these for someone under 18. It will prohibit their sale from vending machines and retailers will have to register that they sell them as they do for ordinary tobacco products. The second part of the bill deals with care settings and places this duty of candour on health and social care organisations to inform people that they have been harmed a result, as a result of care or treatment received. And I, and I welcome the amendment that was accepted by the Minister early, earlier as outlined by Malcolm Chisholm. And thirdly, the bill creates a criminal offence of ill-treatment or willful neglect in health and social care settings. President officer, maybe just a brief word on the e-cigarettes e issue. I know constituents of mine and some colleagues in here who say that they have helped them reduce their smoking habit. And the Scottish Government recognises that they may have a role to play in cutting smoking. But there's really limited data available to allow us to be conclusive one way or the other. But I'm pretty sure that will emerge in due course. Um, the bill, I think, in summary, President Officer, is another good step forward uh, for us in helping prevent younger people from getting hooked in smoking and helping to protect people in healthcare settings, as has been outlined. I think we're winning the battle in smoking, but there is still a long way to go until we can finally extinguish cigarettes from Scottish culture once and for all. 2034 seems a long way off from now, but if we get this right, we can look forward to that tobacco-free society in Scotland. Thank you very much.
Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, thank you very much. I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Jim Hume. Mr. Lyon and Ed Milner, I would observe that this is the fifth bill that the Health Committee has done in recent times in the last five months, to be precise, as I know because I've only been on the Health Committee for the last uh, five months. And like her, I want to pay tribute to our clerks who have been brilliant on this bill and, in fact, uh, all of our very uh, heavy workload. I would like to thank the people who draft our amendments and, of course, the people who gave such uh, useful and important evidence to us uh, at stage one of the bill. Now, there are five elements in the bill now, and the first two uh, really um, I can deal with quite quickly because everyone supports the right uh, to voice equipment when it's required, and I welcome the fact that's been brought forward. And in fact, the, 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 smoke, the specific smoking provision in creating a legal basis for no smoking in hospitals has actually proved at the end of the day not to be controversial, although there was a lot of discussion about it at stage one. Obviously, some of the detail of that will come in uh, regulations, but I think... Uh, uh, everybody welcomes the fact that that policy is going to be strengthened by uh, being given a legal basis. The duty of candour I have already touched on in my amendment, uh, describing, uh, as others have done, what the purpose of it uh, is. And I thank the Minister again for accepting my two amendments on that. Again, um, reflecting on the evidence we received, Marie Curie, Unison and others supported this legislation strongly because they thought it would help to drive culture change and help to ensure uh, organisational shift towards a supportive culture of learning and improvement. That's certainly the intention of this, and I think it's uh, up to everyone to make sure that that intention is realised uh, in practice. I think one of the uh, recommendations of the committee in their Stage 1 report was that there needs to be coordinated planned and resource programme of awareness raising, training and support for the staff responsible for implementing the policy. That's clearly crucial. Moving on to the ill treatment and willful neglect offence, uh, again, the, the crucial distinction here, which was perhaps not always clear uh, in some of the concerns expressed to us, is that this is to do with deliberate actions, uh, unlike the duty uh, of candidate. And again, the issue of training, uh, support and education for relevant staff and organisations is absolutely crucial so that people understand uh, what the offence is uh, and make sure that people know, in particular organisations, know what the, their roles and responsibilities are are. Um, perhaps the most contentious at the end of the day turned out to be the provisions around um, nicotine vapour products, although I don't think today we'll, we'll replicate the, 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 the sometimes acrimonious uh, tone of the debate we had at stage one when people, as it were, pro e-cigarettes and anti them lined up against each other. I, I think the striking thing is, although there are widely varying views in the Parliament and outside about this, all of us actually support what is uh, in the bill. I did a proposal an amendment at committee just to dis make sure we can distinguish between the uh, uh, the e-cigarette e part of the register and the tobacco part and the minister reassured me when I had a meeting with her that they will appear quite separately to the public uh, on the website so I think that meets uh, at least in part the concerns of many people who who do not wish uh, uh, ordinary cigarettes and e-cigarettes to be conflated in any uh, of the uh, possible contexts. But we all support, obviously, actions against uh, young people uh, accessing uh, these products, and we all uh, support uh, a degree of advertising control, although, again, the detail of that will come out in uh, regulations. But there were many um, pieces of useful evidence, and I, I was particularly struck by the evidence of Professor Linda Bald, who's done a great deal of work on e-cigarettes, and you may have heard her on Good Morning Scotland at 7.15 this morning, and certainly I've been very influenced by uh, her views on this. And one of the things she said in evidence to us was that a recent study shows that people in the UK who stopped smoking using e-cigarettes are 60% more likely to be successful than those who use willpower alone or who buy nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, over the counter. Now, we all want to see uh, 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 Scotland reaching its ambitious target of reducing smoke and prevalence to 5% by 2034. I'm sure we'd like to see it even lower, but I do believe e-cigarettes do have uh, a role to play in that. So, uh, while um, supporting the provisions in the bill, I hope we will be uh, spared uh, the, the, the rather negative uh, comments about them that we sometimes hear. Many thanks, and to now call Jim Hume. 
Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I mentioned back in December during the Bill's uh, Stage 1 debate, Scottish Liberal Democrats, of course, do welcome plans to help uh, people live healthier lives with better guidance and, of course, better support through, of course, better, bolder health initiatives. So I was also glad to see the response of the Scottish Government at the Stage 1 Committee report ahead of the debate and the commitment set out for increased spending on health research. So uh, I'll, I'll return to some of the points I made then uh, for the importance of basing our decision in this bill and the regulation of NV, uh, NVP products on substantial and robust uh, evidence, while, of course, more research is being carried out on the effect of NB, NVPs on health. There are also, of course, more issues around NVPs that I think we still have to consider, uh, as many others have said today. Issu issues such as the marketing and messaging of NVPs, making sure that it's uh, provided as an alternative to those who want to quit smoking and, and not to be used to entice non-smokers to start. So I'm encouraged by the commitments uh, given by the government also in its response to the Stage 1 report that N NHS, Scotland, NHS Health Scotland and the Scottish Directors of Public Health are revisiting their positions uh, on reflecting new evidence and that consistency is marked as a priority amongst NHS stopping smoking services. Uh, I'll remind the members that the passage of my own member's bill in December aims to protect children's health and I would not like to see counterproductive measures uh, to that and subjecting them to new ways of inhaling nicotine and other harmful substances. So I hope to see the measures in this, in this bill being taken forward, of course, productively. Another issue which I voiced concern about uh, over, was over the balance between the use and necessity of the uh, duty of candour and the new responsibilities placed on health and social care organisations. So the imposition of the legal requir requirement must be accompanied I believe by the right education and support, of course, for our uh, hard-working NHS staff. The Royal College of Nursing states that it's crucial that staff have the required knowledge and skills and that they receive adequate training and support around the duty of, of candour. I welcome the fact, however, that this will apply to organisations and not individuals, as this can help manage the risk better, in my view, and uh, lead to more effective learning practices. Uh, the views of uh, some of the professional organisations such as the BMA, uh, must also be considered and, of course, taken into account a, a, as ever, of course. Deputy Presiding Officer, no practitioner wants to see their patients hurt or harmed or receive a level of care of less than they deserve. Uh, but those in instances do happen where the, there's ill treatment and willful neglect. So it should be the duty of the health and social care actors to recognise their responsibility and, of course, be held to account. I was recently con contacted by a constituent who was misdiagnosed with a minor infection rather than cancer that uh, actually was the case. And despite uh, repeated visits, visits to the hospital, that constituent was uh, dismissed, had insufficient checks of, of their medical history and has caused their cancer to develop into one that's now an incurable one. The person is now to, trying to buy as much time to spend with their family because of this mistreatment. So I believe that going a step further and putting in place the right protections, not only for staff, but also for patients, increases the humanity of our health service and recognises the fact that people need to be treated holistically, not just in some medical silo. So we're very supportive of the bill today and look forward to uh, voting for it at decision time. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches. And to Colin Nanette Mill, please. Deputy Presiding Officer. I'll bring my, bring my, begin my closing remarks in this debate by returning to parts two and three of the bill. I grew up in a paternalistic NHS where patients expected and received very little information about the treatment they were given and, ex and who accepted without question that health professionals, particularly doctors, knew best and did their best even when things went wrong. Never would they ever have thought that such people might apologize for any mistakes made, even if they were admitted. Thankfully, we live in a very different world today, where information is widely available. And I think it's only right that patients are as involved as they wish to be in their treatment plans and progress. And that when something happens which has been or could have been harmful to them, that they have the right to know about it. Of course, not everyone wants to know the detail of the event which went wrong. And that is also their right. But they or their carers and families should be made aware that there is information available to them. A culture of openness 
where health and care organisations and the staff within them feel able to admit mistakes and learn from them, and to inform service users or their carers and families when some treatment has resulted in some harm to them, can only lead to an improvement in patient safety. And that, of course, is paramount in a well-run health and social care system. For this to happen, staff must, of course, be supported so that they can learn from mistakes and make improvements so that such errors are less likely to recur in the future. And they'll require proper training in the knowledge and skills which they will need to comply with a duty of candour in a more open climate within the service which employs them. I do think that in the past, there's sometimes been a tendency within health and care organisations to cover up mistakes and that, that it should be possible in, in this day and it should be possible in this day and age to be open about them and to apologise to service users when they happen. Of course, a duty of candour does already exist for many health and care professionals, but this doesn't cover all professions, and there can be resulting inconsistencies in the application of such a duty in health and care organisations, which hopefully this bill will elim eliminate and allow these organisations to follow best practice and learn from incidents of unintended harm with resultant improvement in the care they provide so that such harm does not arise again in the future. The new offence of ill-treatment and willful neglect is intended to apply only to the most exceptional cases of neglect or ill-treatment. And we know that sadly there are such cases which have been exposed. But even when proved, the perpetrators have on occasion been able to find other employment within the care sector. This was highlighted by my colleague Mary Scanlon in an example she gave at stage two, and the Minister's stage three amendment to deal with this was very welcome indeed. The RCN, however, still have serious reservations about the introduction of this new offence, and they genuinely feel that it could have the opposite effect to what is intended by introducing a duty of candour, with the threat of criminal proceedings mitigating against the building of a culture of openness and transparency. So, presiding officer, given the comments and concerns we've heard about parts two and three of the bill, it seems clear that the education, training and support of health and care professionals will be crucially important in developing the desired culture of openness in our caring professions and organisations. I hope that all aspects of this legislation will have the outcomes they seek to deliver, but I think it will be very important to scrutinise them in a few years' time so that the accumulating evidence on the uses of NVPs, the practical application of the duty of candour, and the use of the new offence of willful neglect and ill-treatment can be revisited and assessed for their effectiveness. Presiding officer, I think we all accept the need for post-legislative scrutiny of the statutory provisions we make in this Parliament. And where there are evolving situations or reservations expressed by respected bodies like the RCN, then I think it is particularly important that these are reviewed in the future. And I do hope that this will be undertaken by future members of the Parliament. However, as I said in my opening remarks, overall, we are content with this bill as amended and we will give it our support. Thank you. Many thanks. I should have said at the start of closing speeches, we have a few minutes in hand if, uh, if members are inclined to take interventions or wish to take a little bit longer in their speeches. I call on Rhoda Grant. Six minutes or so, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I think this has been a good debate, and it's sometimes difficult to debate a bill um, that covers um, such a range of different issues. Um, I think, I suppose, to sum it up, we all want and want and look forward to a tobacco-free society, as Willie Coffey said, um, and this bill will go some way towards it. But we also look forward to a society um, where there is better patient-centred care. And again, I think the bill will help with that. Um, the Minister mentioned the single register for NVPs and tobacco products, and I think that was one of the things that really um, got the committee thinking, because there were certainly concerns from people like pharmacists who were concerned about having to register as tobacco retailers if they were going to use uh, NVPs as part of their smoking cessation programme. So it was very clear that we had to make sure that there was no barriers um, for NVPs being used to help people stop smoking. Um, but at the same time, make sure the, the protections were in place. And uh, Malcolm Chisholm 
as I said, put forward amendments and sought that, and I think received that reassurance from the Minister, that they would be dealt with quite separately to give comfort um, to organisations that would be selling MVPs, certainly for therapeutic reasons. Um, we, I think, have to be careful about the use of MVPs, because while they are there are undoubted health benefits as an alternative to smoking. Um, they may have um, health uh, problems themselves. And we heard about something called popcorn lung, um, which we didn't go into it. Um, but some of the chemicals um, that are used in NVPs can cause other conditions um, that might have um, health problems all of their own. So therefore, I think it was right and proper to put in restrictions about age to whom they could be sold, um, and indeed restrictions on uh, vending machines. And I think a, a lot of speakers talked about um, wanting to use MVPs um, as an alternative to smoking, but uh, Jim Hume um, certainly made the point that it shouldn't, they should not be used as an access into nicotine dependence. And all, we had some evidence from the committee that said that some of the other chemicals used in cigarettes actually make them more addictive, so nicotine used in MVPs might not be as addictive as nicotine in cigarettes. But again, this is a developing industry and those things can change. So we would certainly never want to see those kind of chemicals used in MVPs that would make people more addicted to them, especially if there are health problems. Um, Nanette Milne talked about smoking in hospital. I think it was Nanette Milne that talked about smoking in hospital grounds for, and certainly for psychiatric patients. Um, there were real concerns there because if someone is not well, um, obviously chemicals have an impact on that, and we need to make sure that people in psychiatric hospitals um, have the ability to to smoke if they really need to. And uh, we're, I, Mary Scanlon and I actually visited New Craigs and were delighted to see that there was going to be secure outside space at that hospital to allow people to go outside. And I think that would be really important in all psychiatric hospitals where people might not be so able um, to give up smoking when they were receiving treatment. So I think we need to be, be sure and be clear about giving people those choices, especially when um, they, they're suffering from conditions where it would be cruel and unfair to, to make them change behaviour when they need um, our compassion. Yes, Minister. And I think the member raises a, a, a very interesting point, and it does show the need uh, for a person-centred approach and uh, some leeway. But I think that increasingly uh, the evidence is coming forward that in terms of both mental health patients and prisoners, that if they were given the encouragement to give up smoking, that it would actually help their overall health and that these options should be available as well. Rosie Grant. I wasn't suggesting for one moment that those options shouldn't be available because addictions of any kind obviously have an impact on people's mental health. So um, stopping smoking is obviously the desired outcome. It's just how we get people to do that if they're not well. Um, we need to be, have compassion alongside encouragement to stop smoking. Um, there was a lot of discussion about um, the duty of candour and again I'll re-emphasise that I think that is a really important part of patient care and patients should have the information um, that, that they need when they're receiving care. But the duty of candour in the bill can be quite bureaucratic in that there is a reporting system and a system for an apology. And I would hope that um, when guidance is given about how you implement the bill, that the apology is meaningful. Because I think if people, if this process were mis mishandled, it could actually cause additional distress. So people need to be quite clear that the apology is not just being given because it has to be given, but actually be, be given um, and, and meant. Um, Malcolm Chisholm also pointed out that this part of the bill it's not so much about punishing, it is about keeping uh, patients informed, but it's also about learning and improving the service we give um, to, to people. And his amendments, even when a patient doesn't want um, to, to exercise their duty of 
CANDOR it allowed for the circumstances surrounding the event to be examined so that um, staff could learn from that experience. And I think that's really important and I think was echoed ag again by Nanette Milne, who talked about the paternalistic um, NHS that hopefully we've seen the back of. I think bits of it still exist here and there, but I think it's really important um, that we make sure it's patient-centred, not staff-centred and not led. Um, Nanette also kind of give um, or or raise the issue of the RCN's concerns about um, willful neglect and their concerns that this would be a barrier um, to openness and whistleblowing. And I think rightly um, she wants that reviewed and I think I would echo that because I think it's really important that we have a very open health service and that there are no barriers to be people um, reporting concerns and making sure that they don't happen again. But, you know, saying that while supporting very much um, the offence of willful neglect, because Mary Scanlon talked about a case, but we've all had cases which have been really sad and heartbreaking about willful neglect of patients. And when that's um, in a palliative care setting, that's even worse because there is no way of pulling back that and making something better. And it can lead, uh, it can lead um, to families having real difficulties difficulty getting over um, their grief. Um, just touching on communication equipment, I'm not sure how much time I have, presiding. I can allow you the time to touch on the, equipment, the communication <laughs> equipment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I raised um, with the First Minister at Question Time the Sue Ryder report about um, neurological disorders and the treatment of patients. And I think this communication equipment is a step towards that because it's a lot of people that have neurological disorders that also have uh, changes to their communication. But I think it's important that this should only be one part of that. I think we have to go back and look at how we provide care for neurological disorders, um, examine that closer and come forward with a strategy in the next parliament to make sure that people, especially young people or people who have lost, as Nanette Milne talked about her friend, who had lost the ability to speak, get the care and treatment they want. So, presiding officer, you would draw to close now. On, on that note, I will just simply reiterate that we will support the bill tonight. Many thanks. And I now call on Maureen Watt to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until 15.50. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. And I'd like to thank members for their contributions this afternoon. And I welcome the breadth of support that the bill has received through all its parliamentary stages and the constructive, members of, uh, constructive nature of what uh, members have uh, said in the debate. In particular, I'd like to offer my thanks to those experts who gave their time to provide evidence uh, to the Health and Sport Committee, almost all of whom advocated that this legislation was both proportionate and necessary. I think the bill offers us a real chance to progressing our commitment to ensuring that people in Scotland live longer, healthier lives. And I'd also like to thank the bill team for all their hard work in getting us to this point today. It is, presiding officer, an important milestone. It will play its part alongside the vast range of measures that will continue to be progressed by the Scottish Government to reduce tobacco-related harm. It will also see specific regulations of NBPs put on the statute book uh, for the first time, and many members in the debate um, mentioned uh, how uh, NVPs are a new product and uh, evidence on uh, their effectiveness or uh, whether they're harmful is, is it still emerging because they are uh, such new products. And of course, we absolutely don't want to stigmatise people who are using NVPs to come off uh, tobacco-related products, which we know are much more harmful. And it is really quite amazing that we can start to put in place legislation on a new product and not be playing catch up like we have been uh, with uh, tobacco products uh, and alcohol products. So that's why we're committed to preventing access to NVPs uh, by young people under the, under the age of 18. Um, however, alongside that, we want to consider what more could and should be done to control the sale and marketing uh, of these new products. And that's why we will um, make sure that there's no advertising of these products uh, on billboards uh, and posters. Um, 
and we do now see the advertising of these products on uh, television um, and there is EU legislation which must come into domestic UK law by 2016, making sure uh, that there are no long, these products are no longer advertised uh, on these uh, medium. So I'm confident that the bill has struck the right balance in this respect. In doing so, we contribute to children having the best start in life by creating a society where they're supported uh, to make healthy choices. The bill will uh, help to build further openness and transparency in our healthcare uh, systems. And uh, it does allow patients and service users to know about what has gone wrong in the course of their treatment, uh, should they wish. And it will encourage apology and a learning and improvement to prevent it from happening again. I think the idea uh, that Nanette Mill uh, raised and that the RCN raised in their briefing that the offences will in, uh, prevent a culture of transparency implies a kind of pessimistic view of the attitudes of health and social care workers. And I don't share that view um, as the offences are not aimed at instances of unintended or unexpected harm. And I'm sure as the law comes into force that uh, any reservations I think uh, will be uh, dispelled. Um, part three is about premeditated neglect or ill treatment and I think Rhoda Grant was right to, make, to point out that duty of candour and willful neglect are completely uh, separate. Um, premeditated neglect or ill treatment of people receiving health care or social care is deplorable. Uh, those who commit such crimes, including organisations as well as individuals, need to be dealt with by the criminal justice system and the bill will provide um, for specific action um, against these crimes. It has been born out of incidences, uh, thankfully not in Scotland, um, but in other parts of the UK and I think it's important that people know that in the very small number of cases where there has been willful neglect um, that people can expect a respectful and compassionate care uh, rather um, than have and where there has been willful neglect that people are suitably uh, punished. Um, in terms of um, I think Nanette Milne and others mentioned um, mental health patients and prisoners and um, their use of tobacco. And it is, of course, up to health boards uh, as part to implement strategies uh, as part of their wider commitment to health improvement. And I think now that prisoner health is under health boards, that should make it uh, easier in terms of um, prisoners stopping Pro, uh, um, smoking. An improvement in patient safety and the health of individuals goes right through this bill. I know that uh, Rhoda Grant said uh, that it was uh, all encompassing and a lot of different things. We have had catch all bills uh, before, but um, I think it's important that this bill uh, is passed at decision time. And the addition to the bill of the uh, voice. Uh, augmentation uh, communication um, equipment is uh, to be welcomed by everyone. This morning I visited the Ewan Macdonald uh, Centre and met with Ewan and young Greta and Paul who is in the gallery and saw how the use of voice equipment made it, made, enabled them to join in conversations um, with others um, and the equipment is so wide ranging now and that is why the bill has been, the clauses in the bill have been left deliberately uh, open so that people can have access to the right equipment um, at the right time. And uh, Rhoda Grant mentioned uh, Sue Ride, the Sue Ryder event uh, last night. I have DVU Court in my constituency and visit it often and 
I can see how, in, for many patients there, voice equipment given at the right time uh, would be very useful. So, uh, presiding officer, in approving this wide-ranging bill, Parliament will be contributing to a number of better outcomes for Scotland, including continuing to build on our vision of a tobacco-free generation by 2034, protect, protecting non-smokers, but particularly children and young people from nicotine addiction by reducing access to and marketing of these new products, improving the delivery of health and social care services, and ensuring that nobody in Scotland dies without a voice. I thank all members who've helped uh, with the passage of this bill. Um, there haven't been uh, that many amendments at stage two, uh, or indeed today at stage three. I cannot uh, guarantee that that will be the same for the burials and cremations bill, which the Health and Sport Committee has also to um, consider at stages two and three. But, uh, presiding officer, I hope that Parliament will unanimously pass uh, this bill at decision time. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. Care Scotland bill. Can I just say to members that there is a likelihood that we will be sitting beyond 5.30 next Tuesday. So that will, of course, be subject to the Parliamentary Bureau on Tuesday morning. But I thought you would appreciate a heads up in that matter. We, I am minded now to accept a motion without notice from Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, bringing forward decision time to now. Happy to move, presiding officer. I will now put the question. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We now move to decision time. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion number 15801, in the name of Maureen Watt, on the health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill is passed. <coughs> that concludes decision time and I now close this meeting. <laughs>